dear colleagues and students. The management school of the Sorbonne is very pleased and honored to welcome the vice president of IBM, in charge of corporate marketing, Mr. John Kennedy. Over the the last century, IBM has been a leading actor in the software and IT services industry. According to Interbrand, the Blue Chip Company will soon outperform Coca-Cola in terms of brand equity. Let me express a warm thank you to Mr. John Kennedy for accepting the invitation of Jean-Marc Leu for joining us today. I would like to point out some of the similarities between IBM and the Sorbonne University. Both are players in the big league. With more than 400,000 employees, IBM now is the real leader of the software, software and IT services industry. As Big Blue, the Sorbonne University is a very well-known brand all over the world. At this point, we could dare a second comparison with our department. In fact, the management school of the Sorbonne is the leading university management school in France. And so far, we are only speaking of France. Open the divide and ever-changing business world, our department is constantly intensifying its ties to thousand companies, whatever size and sector. By the same token, top-notch associations are adding value to our programs, diplomas and teaching methods. <coughs> to mention a few, l'Ordre des experts comptables, l'Association Française du Marketing, l'Association Française des Trésoriers d'Entreprise, l'Association Française des Transports ou encore l'Association des Directeurs Financiers et de Contrôle de Gestion. They all still to shape our excellence. Today, we are particularly honored to add IBM to our ever-growing network of business partners. For the last decades, IBM not only has been a major player in the worldwide IT and software markets, it also undertook crucial strategic change when it sold its PC division to Lenovo back in 2005. It just moved from product marketing to service marketing. With this strategic shift, IBM proved ready to respond to the very needs of the market. This entailed a major turnaround of the entire IT industry, a move which proved to be the right one. The figures speak out for themselves. Please be assured I won't go on any longer, not being a marketer myself. I will shortly hand over the podium to John Kennedy, Vice President Corporate Marketing at IBM, and B2B Marketer of the Year, according to B2B Magazine last year. To finish off, let me quote Thomas G. Watson, who said half a century ago, once an organization loses its spirit of pioneering, and rest on its early work, its progress stops. The great accomplishments of man are resulted from transmission of ideas and enthusiasm. It is this willingness to constantly progress, to share knowledge and to score enthusiasm that is a third and definite commonality between IBM and the management school of the Sorbonne University. Like IBM, which launched uh, its Motor Planet program uh, campaign, we have launched our 
Smarter Department Program to prepare the future by building more efficient teaching systems. With great pleasure, I am honored to give the floor to John Kennedy. Mr. Vice President, please. Merci beaucoup. Je me présente, Didier Barbet, je suis vice-président du marketing et de la communication d'IBM France et je suis très honoré, et nous sommes très honorés, que vous accueilliez aujourd'hui IBM dans cette très honorable et historique maison. Je vais juste switcher en anglais, si vous m'y autorisez. And I would like to thank you, Professor Medan, for your kind words and your welcome to John. And uh, what I would like to do uh, to introduce John is just to say a few words about IBM, but you said most of them. 2011 is a big year for IBM. We are a one billion, 100 billion company celebrating 100 years. As you said, this is the first B2B brand, because Coca-Cola is the first one, uh, according to Interbrand uh, rating. And as the more world's oldest information technology company, we have learned some very valuable lessons that you mentioned. But let me repeat because this is very important for all of you. One thing we learned is that to make an enduring impact, you have to manage for the long term. Manage for the long term. Another lesson is that it's not enough to merely enter markets you have to create them, create markets. And the third lesson is to be bold. Bold meaning that you never ever stop moving to the future. I think John Kennedy, who is there, has made his mark at IBM by talking, taking all these lessons to heart. He joined IBM in 1996 as a product, product marketing manager in the PC division in Raleigh. And then, in 98, he moved to Asia Pacific and take uh, several roles on sales and marketing to become the Vice President marketing and Marketing of IBM Japan and IBM Asia Pacific. And then he came back in 2006 to lead marketing and strategy IBM Americas, which is the largest sales territory of IBM. John, was named Vice President Marketing and Communication, IBM Corporation, in March 2009. And he's responsible for the IBM brand. Thanks, John, for the number two. Ready? And uh, to develop and deploy the IBM Smarter Planet Agenda, which describe the next era of information technology and its impact on business and society. John is working closely to John Iwata, who deeply apologized, ladies and gentlemen, for not being here this morning. He said to me yesterday over the phone that he promises if you invite him again to come here and talk to you. John serves as the board member of the Association of National Advertisers and Business Marketing Association. You mentioned that he was B2B Marketing of the Year in 2010. And before joining IBM, John worked at Procter & Gamble, the, the marketing company, and uh, National Bank, now known as Bank of America. To hear about IBM transformation and our latest thinking about the future of marketing, please welcome John Iwan. John Kennedy. For the last access, Good morning, everyone, and uh, it is great to be here at this distinguished in institution. It's my first time at the Sorbonne, so I'm quite honored, and I'll do my best to fill the very big shoes, as we say, of my boss. Um, but hopefully, as future business leaders, uh, you, you will have an opportunity to sometimes fill in for your big boss sometimes. So, um, anyway, I was where you were. Uh, several years ago as well in graduate school studying business so it's a great honor and uh, 
you've got a great chance here to learn from other companies, and maybe there are a few lessons today that we can impart on, on IBM. What we'll talk about today is a story of transformation, uh, a story of how a hundred-year-old company has changed and managed to endure, but as well, a story of the transformation of marketing, the marketing discipline, and how in our learning of how to better market IBM, we believe we're actually helping evolve the discipline forward and maybe begin to see some clues on where the marketing discipline is going, maybe leave you with some things um, as future business leaders or future marketers. And I haven't practiced this, so I'm doing this. Let's see here. He's a, a Mac expert. <laughs> so um, while while we're solving the technology uh, question here, um, a lot of the story of IBM is how a B2B company, which doesn't necessarily have any products that you all would consume, um, there we go, was able, to, was able to grow its brand and value even though we don't necessarily have any products that you would uh, engage with. And is IBM used to be in the PC business, right? Remember the ThinkPad? Um, but in, in 2004, let's see, good? Okay. okay. And we we're going to show... So now, we've got a very nice video we're going to open with, but we're going to save that to the end. So to tell the story of IBM's transformation, we want to go back a few years and talk about when we were in a business that sold to consumers. Uh, we had the third largest PC business in the world. We sold over 100 million PCs. But as the PC category was commoditizing, and as the margins in that business were declining, it was harder for us to differentiate the PC business, uh, largely because within the PC industry, Microsoft and Intel were extracting most of the value in that business. It was very hard to differentiate our brand. We decided to sell that business. Um, and to many, particularly those of us in marketing, and I worked, and may, may have picked up in DDA's introduction, 
I spent most of my early career in the PC business. And I was, we were all very nervous about selling our, this, these great brands, ThinkPad. I mean, these were brands we built up with great brand equity. What would happen to the IBM brand? There was no way for a consumer to engage with the IBM brand. Would we become some stodgy B2B you know, uh, company? So it's an interesting story to see what happened. Um, so once we, 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 sold, we sold the uh, sold our business, and yet again, this is not one to cooperate. Here, hold on. Here we go. Okay, I'll just advance from the system. So, you know, with some headlines here from the New York Times, IBM said to put its PC business on the market, end of an era in computing, right? So, big, monumental, monumental move by IBM. Um, and again, a lot of questions around what would happen to our brand. So, but let's take a look. I mean, um, over that time, our earnings per share, since we sold the PC business, has continued to grow year on year as we move to more of a high value kind of a business model. If you look at our gross profit margin as well, um, as we moved, uh, yeah, okay, you can, okay, good. Um, moved out of the PC business, we continue to have a richer business model. Our market value continues to grow. Um, and in fact, a few weeks ago, our stock hit uh, another historical high. So it's a good time to be an IBM stock, and we're now uh, more valuable than, than Microsoft. Um, there's some analysts that say it'll hit, hit that high. But let's take a look at the brand. Um, and many companies have their own brand measures, but if you look at Interbrand, Interbrand is one of the more well-known you know, brand measures. Um, since that time of selling our PC business, our brand value has grown 30%. And we haven't overtaken Coke yet, but uh, we're optimistic if we stay on this track, we have a shot at being maybe one of the most, the most valuable brand in the world. But we're a B2B brand, right? How many of you have bought, any of you buy IBM products? No. You know, so what have we done to continue to build our brand equity? And I think this is where we start to talk a little bit about where marketing is going. Because when we sold our PC business, we had to think hard about what kind of business is IBM in? And as we market, what do we market? Do we market what we sell? Because a lot of what we sell now really just goes to large enterprises and big companies. Uh, what we decision we made was we wanted to focus on how we would be the most relevant in the world. Would, would IBM's brand be as much about the kinds of products we sell? Because products come and go. We're a 100-year-old company. When we were first founded 100 years ago, IBM sold meat slicers and scales and then tabulating machines. IBM, our portfolio has completely changed. So we felt like we couldn't base our brand on necessarily what we market because markets come and go, right? Um, I was, just last week, I was with AOL, and AOL, I was doing a little video with AOL, and AOL asked me, you know, what, what kind of market should they be in? Because they were an internet company. Well, the internet is changing. Should AOL be an internet company? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the shift we made towards relevance and how this has contributed to our growth uh, in, in brand value. So we, we describe this as something called corporate character which is a deeper definition of what a brand can be. Because your character, the character of a person or the character of a company, largely reflects what you stand for, how you think, how you relate. Your, depending upon your type of character, you may or may not relate or connect with all audiences. But with a clarity of corporate character, that's something that can endure regardless of what product category you're in or what kind of services that you sell. So for us, we started on this, on this journey of really redefining our corporate character about, about seven, eight years ago with something we called a values jam. And we created, it wasn't called social media, but back in 2004, we essentially 
hosted something like a, a multi-audience, multi-participant blogging, tweeting. At the time, there weren't even we weren't even calling it tweeting. We didn't even know we were doing social media. It was a three-day intensive dialogue around, you know, what's IBM really all about? And one of the most provocative questions we asked in this jam, if you will, was if IBM were to cease to exist tomorrow, what difference would IBM have made in the world? And that was a way of getting at this enduring question of well, what kind of business are we really in? You know, beyond whatever products or services we're selling today, what contributions have we made in the past? What contributions do we believe we're going to make in the future? Because this was a way of really getting at what made us relevant as a company and trying to get at the soul of the company and the corporate character of the company. Something that's more enduring than just, again, the products or services or research we're doing at any one period of time. So that plus uh, what we've gone through this last year in our centennial. So our centennial year was a year not just to celebrate our birthday or to chronicle the accomplishments of IBM over 100 years. It was largely focused on really mining our history, trying to understand what we've learned over that period of time. And as a result of those learnings, what that could tell us about our character, and then as well what we could teach others as a result of our learning. So as a result of that, we learned a lot of things. We learned that you know IBM has made significant scientific achievements over its history, contributing things like fractal geometry, contributing things like DRAM, um, contributing iconic products like the selective typewriter, like the PC, like the System 360, one of the really the first you know, mainframe computer. Uh, IBM's contributed some very uh, progressive hiring practices like offering equal opportunity uh, long before the Civil Rights Act in the United States um, and, and, and so forth. So we learned that at, at, at its core, IBM's character was largely about driving progress. And over the course of our centennial, we had chronicled all these accomplishments and these 100 icons that you see here you know, before you that we're sort of going through. And um, although you'll never see us use the word progress, go ahead and click through. These go quite a ways. There are a few of these here to show. Uh, the range of accomplishments, there's the selective typewriter that IBM has contributed uh, over time. Participating in the NASA uh, moon, the, the NASA moon landing, the Apollo, 13, the Apollo programs back in the 60s, um, helping to create the first uh, airline reservation system, helping to create the UPC code. Um, here's some icons related to uh, our progressive hiring practices. So, you know, the, go ahead and, and here we go. Go to the next one. So, you know, the consequence of, of experiences like the JAM as well as, as the Centennial helped us tr really define and hone what we meant by our corporate character. Go to the next one. And here, we describe it with this sentence. And you may never see us uh, never see this in an advertisement per se, but this statement of believing in progress and at its core, the application of intelligence, reason, and science can improve business, society, and the human condition essentially is the core, the idea that's the core of the IBM brand. And if you read that, that's something that endures regardless of any any decade, any particular product cycle. But as a group of marketers, it's one thing to work with your leadership team to try to sort through what you think the essence of that character is, to the extent you've got an ambition in any company to endure for 100 years or more. But it's another thing altogether to try to activate that corporate character. And I think that's where, as a group of marketing leaders back at IBM, we really had to do our work. What does it mean to express that in the work you do as a group of marketing leaders? How do you take that idea and execute that in a way so that it comes through in the way that you show up as a company. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples to show you some things we've done in IBM um, to try to take this corporate character and use that in a way that can actually, that has, we believe has helped build our, our brand value. And we start with you know, this quote, you know, everyone will be familiar with Abraham Lincoln, I guess, um, you know, famous 
United States, famous U.S. president, but he had a he had a statement that character is like a tree, reputation is like a shadow. The shadow is what we think of it. The tree is the real thing. And if any of you are taking marketing classes here, because I know this is probably a broad broad management school, in marketing class you probably you learn of things like managing the the impression of your brand. You know, and the perception of the brand, in the image of your brand, right? A lot of communication and marketing science is around managing your image. Well, this sort of takes a different tack. This says, well, you know, the image isn't unimportant, but more important than the image. Okay, so if image is the shadow, image is the shadow, sort of what you cast off, it's what people think of you. What's more important is really the tree which is getting at this point around character, which also reflects the nature of how markets today consume information because markets and audience today are so bombarded with advertising and bombarded with information, markets are a little more skeptical of what we say about ourselves. When we show up and we advertise and we say, I'm a great company or this is a great product, markets and audiences today are too, are, right, they have too much information. They don't believe us as much as they believe other people they trust, right? Rather than believe an ad, you'll probably better believe your neighbor sitting next to you and their recommendation on whether it's a good company or a bad company or a good product, right? So that makes it a lot harder for, our, for, for marketers. We can do a lot of great work to develop a good image and develop a great advertising. But the harder work is to really to establish what's most enduring and what's most true. What's the tree? But then how do you activate the tree? I mean, how do you how do you then express that in the way that you execute? So at IBM, we use a frame like this where we say, okay, we have this concept of our corporate character, but then what does it mean then to look like IBM, sound like IBM, think like IBM, or then truly be, what does it mean then to really for something to perform like IBM, really be IBM. So, and we take this very seriously. We spend a lot of time thinking about it. You know, looking like IBM, you read that there, it's not about a logo, it's not about a color palette, it's not about a personality. To look like IBM, something has to be purposefully designed. It has to have a clarity that makes you think it has to enhance your understanding. We, that's written in such a way that that can be applied to almost any product category. There's nothing about that that even says IT. There's nothing about that that even says technology, right? Because fundamentally, IBM's a company that cares about science and technology to drive progress in the world and improve society and the human condition. So we think about how we activate our character in a way that's very, very enduring. What does it mean to sound like IBM? Does IBM sound like an engineer? Does it sound like an American? Does it sound like a politician? What's the voice of IBM? IBM listens, it engages, appreciates your point of view. It's optimistic. And it makes a case with intelligence, but also with empathy. So I won't go through all of these, but this is about taking, even though character sounds a lot like the soul of your company and the essence of your brand, I mean, in a way, but it's, this is the hard work we believe is marketing now to go think through how then you express that. And we use this kind of a frame to help us do our work. Now what I want to do is actually take a case study and help you see how we've applied this frame so you can appreciate how we've used it in a real practical way. Um, and I guess maybe before I do that, uh, go to the next slide. As we apply this frame, stay here for a minute, if you can see how we've taken this frame and split it between ownership and collaboration. Um, as, as we apply this in the company, there are parts of this where the ownership you know, is quite narrow, like the looks like. Uh, in fact, I'm in part of the company that's a little bit of a policeman for the looks like. You, know, you have to have some discipline around, around that. But um, as you go down the line of the performs like, there's more collaboration 
there's more involvement from across the team, and that's that's just that's just the, the point we want to make there. So this is the example I want to use to help you understand how we apply this frame. Um, and the example I want to use is uh, something called Watson. And I'm not sure if you all would have been familiar with this, but earlier this year, uh, IBM uh, invented a system that competed on a game show in the United States called Jeopardy. Have any of you heard of the Jeopardy game show? Okay. It is, I'm sure, uh, like many quiz shows you see on television, right, where contestants get up and try to answer very hard questions to win lots of money, right? Jeopardy in the United States is very famous in that um, it covers virtually any topic, and uh, it's, it's, it's known for being a very, very difficult quiz show. Um, and IBM, during its history, has set out some grand challenges for our researchers. A grand challenge. So to challenge our researchers to go accomplish something in the field of computer science that not only is very interesting, but as well will advance the field of computer science. So we've done this several times in our history. Um, the most recently was the Watson example. But about 15 years ago, we built a system to play chess. And this system was called Deep Blue. And you, you may, may not be, this is probably before, uh, really before many of your time, but back in the early 90s, we built a system called Deep Blue. It played, at the time, the reigning grand champion of chess, Gary Kasparov. And IBM was successful, made a lot of news, a chess, uh, excuse me, a computer beating a grand champion in chess. But this is what Deep Blue looked like. And it's sort of, as we took that out, those were sort of the images we used to describe what was happening. A big monolithic computer, you know, a human being sitting by himself, solitary, playing against a computer. This was looked like IBM. And this was sound like IBM. This was the message we put around the competition, be afraid, right? Computers are beating chess players. Not exactly very optimistic, right? But this was sort of, this is how the company at the time talked about the grand challenge. Um, now, when we had Watson, we had, we had another opportunity. We learned from, learned from our experience. How are we going to apply the corporate character to really bring Watson to life? We had another great opportunity. We were going to be on television, uh, national television in the United States for three week, three nights, and we could use our corporate character frame to make some decisions on how we wanted Watson to come across. So the first thing we had to decide, what is Watson going to look like? What should Watson look like? Watson's a computer that's going to play in a game show. So we had a couple of choices. So this was a choice. Is the Ogilvy team here? Did someone say Ogilvy's here? No? Okay, our Ogilvy team brought us, Ogilvy and Mather brought us a few uh, choices. So this is another choice they brought. I don't know if you're easy to see that. It's kind of creepy, you know, sort of a digitized human being. Uh, this is another one. Uh, the, the, the research team loved this one. Sort of the eight bar logo over a human being figure with a background. I mean, these were all, we weren't sure any of these really spoke to our, our our corporate character, but these were the kind of things we started with. Um, what were we going to call? What were we going to call it? So we had to name it. It wasn't always called Watson. So the teams came in and gave us these kinds of names. You know, Thinker, Eureka. I mean, if our corporate character was to be, had to be empathetic, be optimistic, come off like a listener. They're kind of hard, kind of hard names, right? Um, click again. Yeah. Okay. So, but this is where we ended up, though. For looks like. So, for we decided to name it Watson after our founder. Um, but Watson also has a bit of a cerebral uh, aspect to it, and we based. The, uh, this, we created an avatar based on our Sparter Planet 
iconography, Smarter Planet branding. Have some of you seen our Smarter Planet? Familiar with some of that? Um, but you know, Watson looks kind of playful. Watson looks approachable. Watson looks like um, you know he could be he could potentially listener be a listen. But what's interesting is Watson would move in a way such that depending upon whether Watson was thinking or working on a problem, the avatar color and visuals would change to correspond to sort of the emotion that Watson was feeling. So that's sort of where we ended up. And what you see there on stage is uh, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter, who at the time were the two reigning grand champions on this quiz show called, called Jeopardy. And Watson, of course, was, was quite successful. Um, but then we had to talk a little bit about, well, what was the point we wanted to make with Watson? What, what did it mean to be IBM? And these were some ads that uh, the teams built for us. Um, and what you see about these ads is that they kind of talk about IBM, the world's smartest computer company, or how powerful Watson is. Well, again, we didn't think that was really in line with our corporate character. Um, and what we ended up with was, go to the next one, something that really emphasized the human achievement of Watson. This was not about IBM's technical capability. That's not what we wanted to emphasize. We wanted to emphasize the contribution to the world and, and, and what this meant for, uh, for science and technology. Um, and if we have, if this will work. If we have, do we have the audio working? This, this is a commercial we wanted to show you um, for how, how we then express Watson and, and what Watson is uh, for outside of a game show, but for the contribution it could make to industries like healthcare. So let's see if we can get that, get this going. There are over 12,000 diseases in the world. Some take years to diagnose and treat. How can doctors find insights and a body of medical knowledge that doubles every five years? New solutions based on IBM Watson are being developed to help doctors analyze a patient's history, symptoms, and the latest medical literature to make faster, more accurate diagnoses. Hello, my name is Watson. Let's build a smarter planet. So that's an example of a television commercial we then again created to explain uh, the, the benefits and power of this, this incredible system uh, to industries like healthcare, uh, to take just tremendous amounts of data, terabytes of data, and sort through it and make connections to be able to identify uh, better cures, do faster research, um, and so forth. So that's a story that, at this point, around how IBM has transformed from a company that sold PCs, how we moved the way we approached our brand and our brand character. Uh, in a way to help you know, grow our brand and, and using that with an example of Watson. Now I want to talk a bit about uh, our profession. And you know, hopefully you know, there's some of you who aspire to be marketers and marketing leaders. Uh, there's probably no other part of business that's undergoing more change right now than, than, than the marketing function and the CMO function. And to sort of to capture that, IBM has recently released a CMO study uh, IBM does research with C-suite, C-level leaders every year. Um, we, we do research with CEOs, CFOs, CIOs, and this is our first year to do research with CMOs. Uh, and we felt the time was right because um, CMOs around the world are, are feeling kind of great angst with their inability to catch up with changes in the marketplace. Um, and this is just a great, great fact there that you know CMOs are feeling a lot of the pressure around things like the amount of data they have on their markets and on on their consumers, um, new tools like social media, the fact that uh, markets are now buying across so many channels. Uh, for any given company, you're probably buying in you're, you're buying in a store, you're buying online, um, and so to be able to, to to manage that whole channel mix. And then finally, uh, how the demographics of consumers are changing so much. So we, we pulled this study together as a way to kind of capture uh, what's happening. And just to kind of 
to put into perspective some of the main changes in the function. I mean, the first is, and, and also in some of your marketing classes, uh, you, you may have, you may be studying uh, about the marketing funnel, uh, moving from awareness through consideration to purchase, right? Or uh, this is construct awareness, interest, to de desire, and action. And at one level, there is a lot of truth to the funnel um, because part. It, it, there are, there are purchasing processes that are somewhat hierarchical like this. But the fact of the matter is, this in reality, this is not the way we buy today, right? You don't necessarily um, go make your decisions in a very hierarchical way. Um, as in, you know, someone might uh, make a recommendation to you for a specific product, and you might just go and buy it on that person's recommendation. You may skip all of those and go straight to action, you know, as an example. Um, an, another another um, sort of change in the communications function. This is a very famous book. Some of you who maybe are in the PR side of things will know uh, Edward Bernays wrote this book, Propaganda, uh, earlier this century, which largely asserted that uh, the best way to communicate is by reaching just a small group of people. Um, sort of conversely, it's one of the differences between marketing, I've learned between marketing and, and, and PR is where marketing believes in sort of spray and pray, if you will, uh, reaching as many audiences as you can. External relations focuses a little bit more on finding that key influencer who can then influence many other people. Uh, but as well, that, that was a truism. And then going to the next example, this is a, uh, a memo from back in 1931 from Procter & Gamble asserting that any market can be segmented. The key to markets was to break them up into big categories and, and to do segmentation, and that's the way that you uh, that's the way that you reach people. Well, what we know today is that segments aren't irrelevant, but now we expect to be marketed to more as individuals. Uh, I may, you know, I may be, uh, you know, a, a middle-aged man, you know, in, in a certain part of the United States, but I want to. There's my, my, the companies I interact with have more data on me, I expect them to market to me based upon what they know about my past purchasing patterns, what they expect my future purchasing patterns will be. And so that's also really challenged this notion of, of segmentation. So you know, what, what we, where we believe the function is going is um, less on connecting around a certain level of awareness or on reaching a key influencer um, or on being part of a demographic, um, but towards defining for a brand, and it's kind of an extension of corporate character, essentially what is a core belief that you will share with your audiences around your company, around your product and services? What is something that's enduring that you can, you can share uh, with, with those who are consuming your products and services? And here, I'm going to give another case study around Smarter Planet. And again, Smarter Planet is not something any of you necessarily could have bought, um, because a lot of what we're doing with our Smarter Planet platform is talking to companies about how we can transform them, how we can make water systems smarter, or traffic systems smarter, city smarter, hospital smarter, uh, government smarter. But Smarter Planet was an idea that, that asserted a certain belief, asserted a certain belief about how the world could work and how the world could work better. And it was on the basis of that belief that we were able to bring audiences into our brand who ordinarily wouldn't have any reason to engage. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a case study about Smarter Planet. And when we decided to launch Smarter Planet about three years ago, we did it with a series of long-form essays that we called op-ads, and we ran over 40 of them here. And by way of example, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we approach this and how we use them to forge belief. Um, the first is that we start with facts. Um, we, we felt that you believe in something based upon either facts or evidence that you've seen, or from a recommendation from someone you trust or from your own personal experience. Again, coming back to this point around audiences being very cynical of advertising and cynical about companies saying, I'm the greatest company. We didn't, 
today, we didn't believe that's a very true way to really forge a belief. So starting with facts. So here, again, using some facts about what's happening with war. And then, in terms of people you trust, in this op-ad, we cited work we were doing with other companies. Companies like a trusted company, like Dow Chemical Company. And we're another one. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, here, so here's one we were doing with, uh, with, with the Marine Institute in Ireland, another, another trusted one. Uh, but in all of these, what you don't see is anything about only IBM brings you smarter water, right? Most marketers, maybe you may be looking at, in a, when I was at P&G a long time ago, uh, a lot of what they taught us at P&G was, was around competitive differentiation. Talk about why your product was the very best product. And there's still a lot of that that may be relevant in certain product categories. But here, we didn't think that was the right way for us. We were really trying to forge belief. It was less important for us to talk about IBM than to use facts, evidence, stories about work we were doing with other people to help you draw your own conclusion around the work IBM was doing in this particular area and then forge your own belief and come to your own conclusion about the work we could do. Um, as well, in some of the events that we did, and this is an event we've done around smarter cities, if you go on, there, you won't see IBMers on stage. Here we're actually showcasing our customers. We're showcasing government leaders. We're showcasing political leaders. Um, we recently did an exhibit in New York City, uh, and I think there's, there's a possibility, a portion of it you know, might be coming through you know, France. But again, a way for the public at large to sort of experience what we mean by our corporate character. And these are just some shots from the exhibit. Go on. Okay. So, you know, for, but forging belief, just because if you have you have an audience that might believe uh, believe and share the same belief uh, as your company or or your category. As marketers, we know ultimately what we want these people to do is advocate for us, right? Because now we're learning that social media is a lot like word of mouth on steroids. It's superpower word of mouth. So how do you take someone who may share your belief and actually spur them to actually do something? Because just because you believe something doesn't mean that you will actually you know, do it. Um, you know, for example, I'm sure a lot of you, how many of you here believe exercise? exercise is good for you? How many of you believe exercise is good for you? How many of you actually exercise? Okay. All right. So you believe exercise is good for you, but you don't necessarily, and that's in your personal life, right? Much less with a, with a product or service that you advocate. So, it, so the next step as a marketer really is that after you've you know, forged that belief, what can you do to get your audiences to take some action? What can you do to help them learn how to get started? Uh, so with our clients, we do things like give them examples and references. Um, and then from that, once they've taken some action, to what degree can you build their confidence? Can they associate with some new peer groups? Is there a social network you can create so they can uh, meet and, and understand what else is happening? Others who are, who share that belief and are taking some action. And then finally, what this results in as a group of marketers is this point around enabling advocacy at scale. And I think that's what um, we think is really the future of the function. Um, again, there will always be a place for product superiority. There will always be a place for um, only such and such company advertising. But again, with the amount of information that's in the world today, uh, connecting with your markets is going to happen at a much deeper level, a much visceral level. It's going to happen based upon your corporate character. It's going to happen on a sense of shared beliefs you have, and then to the extent to which you can get them to move to the next step, to, to take some action, and then advocate for you, we think that's really where, well, that's the future of the function, and that's, that's where we're going to mend to the best CMOs of the future. At IBM, we're taking some steps to try to, to uh, uh, dimensionalize this, and, and you can click through these for, for a few. Um, one of which is to look at all of our marketing in a way to ensure it can, design, it can be shared. Stepping into every asset we create, is it designed to be shared? Can it be found, given the importance of search engines? Um, creating, uh, 
something we call social business at IBM, which is helping our clients leverage social media, and then as well, creating tools so that those who do share the same belief or engage in Smarter Planet can actually you know, become, a, become a part of it. So these are these two sides uh, that I wanted to sort of wrap up with here. You know, one, if you take two lessons away, at a company level, um, getting clear on relative to the shadow in the tree, what is the what is your corporate character, those sense of enduring beliefs that will sustain regardless of what category your companies are in. And then as, as marketers, instead of thinking about uh, success as a level of, of awareness or success as a level of reaching key influencers or even getting the right segmentation, starting from that corporate character Identifying what is that shared belief you want to create with your audiences. And then from that shared belief, how then do you want to go build on that to create action with that audience so that over time they'll build the advocacy at scale, the word of mouth on steroids, which will really help fuel your brand power out in the future. So with that, thank you so much for the time. And I think we have time for a few questions at the end. Thank you very much. charts. So, you know, once we sold the PC division, it did have, there, there were some, by memory serves me well, there were some impacts to our business model. There were customers who bought PCs from us at the time that then might have gone and bought products and services from other companies. So that was a process of really rebuilding um, and, you know, recovering from that, you know, from that sale. Um, that was the, that was the primary the primary reason. Um, and, you know, as well, we were, I'm trying to remember that there was sort of a soft spot in, you know, in the market at the time. Um, the, certain parts of the world weren't growing as fast as other parts of the world. Um, so more mature markets like North America and even like Europe uh, weren't growing as fast. So one of the things we did around that time is we made a decision to really restructure the company around two parts of the world. The ma mature parts of the world and then what we call the growth markets. So China, Brazil, India, and now really Africa. So in 2000, right about 2004, 2005, we essentially created a whole group of company only focused on those growth markets because we it was clear that was the future growth of the company. And that has worked out really well for us. And so what you saw 
through the last five or six years is as we put a tremendous amount of focus, that means moving more people there, moving more resources to those countries, our business has responded really well. And uh, just by, you know, it's, as an extension of that, we're now really very, getting very interested in Africa. And we're looking ahead 25, 50 years from now and asking ourselves, what's the next China? What's the next India? And you see the amount of foreign direct investment that are have going into some of these African countries, um, places like Kenya, Nigeria, Ghana, you know, some sports in countries there that are relatively stable, economies are growing really well. So that to us is going to be the next, the next stage for growth. So those two things. Une autre question? Kind of related to what you just said, um, and maybe taking it a bit further, where do you see IBM in, say, 10, 20 years? What, what's your up, basically? Oh, well, yeah, that's a good question. First of all, I, I, I see us geographically much more dispersed and continued uh, more operational growth and operational emphasis outside major markets. So I wouldn't be surprised to see more people, more living in those parts of the world, more of our leadership in those parts of the world. Um, but then from a business model standpoint, we are, you know, this is a company that has changed. It was a hardware company back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, PC company, services company, and now IBM is really a software powerhouse. I mean, you get you crawl through our, you know, we're, it's not software you'd ever buy, you'd ever buy. But if you think about the software that big banks run on, the software that government runs on, this is the, you know, that runs all the systems, that's the kind of, just oversimplifying it, that's the kind of business we're in. We have uh, really, we, we, that part of our business is growing very fast. And then, as well, um, we are now moving in, since analytics, data and analytics is such a big part of our company. You know, we're also using a lot of the software to help companies deal with all the information they have. Governments deal with all the information they have. Um, one of the most data intensive parts of a company is the marketing function. So we're now selling and we're stepping into this business of marketing to marketing leaders and CMOs. And I, I, I think we're going we're to be doing a lot more of that too. Did I answer your question? Is that yeah. good? Okay. Thank you. Um, we know that IBM is taking part of the project um, EcoGrid, financed by the European Union. Can you tell us a bit more about that? And uh, what um, IBM can do to improve and help uh, sustainable development? It's all linked. Yeah, so well, on, a, on a couple of levels. Um, first of all, you know, as a company, uh, we try to be a role model for sustainability as a company. Um, and we've, we've had a good you know, track record there. Um, particularly as it relates to uh, data centers. And I'll describe a little bit about the IT industry. And this, this is something you all might maybe a little bit of background. Um, you know, your university here probably has you know, runs on many, many servers and systems, or bank, think about banks, think about governments, think about any company. Those servers, those systems get very, very hot and consume a lot of energy, right? So IBM has been uh, a leader in devising ways to make data centers uh, much more efficient and run much, much cooler. Okay, so that's, we've been a leader there. As well as partnering with uh, governments and NGOs, institutions all around the world to help advocate for this and help them become you know, greener institutions. Um, the last thing I'll say is, Smarter Planet is largely has has a strong sustainability aspect to it because a lot of uh, the power of using more information to design better systems is so that they can run more efficiently, they can run cooler, consume less power, uh, and so that's a big part of our Smarter Planet. Platform. So I, 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 I'd expect you to see us to continue to innovate there and to continue to advocate very publicly you know, those kind of benefits. Hi, uh, you talked about devices, softwares, and uh, database management, and uh, so you don't think that uh, the uh, information system uh, unit 
will become the new uh, business unit uh, that will be strategic in the company and that will then uh, be, uh, lead you to build what you call a smart plan. So when you say business information unit, what do you mean by that? Um, in the companies you have different uh, business unit and uh, now we know that there are some uh, a unit uh, dedicated to information system management. Oh yeah, I, I think you'll see IBM will always have a very diverse portfolio. You know, we, we, today IBM, just to simplify, basically is in four kinds of businesses. We sell, we sell, the, we sell the computers, the systems, right? Then uh, we sell software, and then we have we, we do consulting. We do technical consulting and we do business consulting. I think we'll always have uh, a broad footprint that way. Um, all that software has to run on something. Yes, but do you think that? Um in the companies in general, uh, this uh, business unit will now be the new strategic unit that, um, like, right now it is, it's a supply chain management who is the new the strategic unit, but do you think that we are going to, there's going to be an evolution? Oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. So, so this is the way I answer that question. So, in the to your point, in the 70s, so ERP, was the big idea, right? automated supply chain was the big idea in the 70s. And sort of the 80s and 90s, financial management and automated financial management was really was a big idea. Um, in terms of where we think a lot of the strategic emphasis is going as it relates to data and information is on the end-to-end the -end commercial function from marketing all the way back through to, to the supply chain. Because now there's so much information the ability to connect that data end to end from the customer all the way back to the supply chain. And we have a word for that, we call it smarter commerce. But that's where we think the what, what the new landscape is. And that's why you're seeing particularly the marketing function because of all the data that's being created in markets with all devices and all the buying and this explosion of marketing services companies that are out there trying to sell analytical tools to what to do with all this information. We think that is going to be really the next big, the next big growth area, and that's why we're stepping into it, um, and hopefully, why a lot of you as graduates are looking to go into it. Yeah, one more. Yeah. What about uh, what about IBM and cloud computing? Great question. That's a great question. Cloud computing. Cloud, I think cloud, I think we believe cloud is going to be one of the, it's going to be the, uh, a consumption model of the future. I mean, the, the promise of cloud is that we'll consume more of our, more of our, our IT that way. You're already consuming, personally, you're consuming your personal IT through the cloud. You're probably saving things up into the cloud. You're using it. I think the promise is that over time for businesses, they'll consume and run more of their IT through the cloud. And does everyone know, everyone familiar with cloud computing, this term, you know, for, you know, again, where uh, content resides uh, not locally, but you know, remotely. So we're, we are, uh, it's a huge investment area for us. It is one of the, our primary growth drivers out through uh, the next five years. And uh, we are working with clients all around the world to help them either set up clouds inside their companies or to leverage clouds remotely. But uh, again, a lot of focus in the consumer space around cloud. You know, particularly I think all of you. I mean, iTunes is one. iTunes, in a way, is one big cloud. I mean, iTunes is going to you know. But we think there's huge growth in the enterprise space, and I think companies are a little more cautious though. They're concerned about security and. You know, putting their company data in the cloud, but over time, as companies get more comfortable with that, we think that's again going to be one of the main consumption models of the future. So, okay, on va demander à Monsieur Barbet de faire la conclusion maintenant, parce qu'on est un petit peu à quoi de temps. John, if you allow me, I'm going to speak a little bit in French. Is that okay with you? I'm sure the audience would prefer that. No, not at all, not at all. Uh, first of all, uh, d'abord, John, merci beaucoup pour uh, cette heure passée uh, avec nous. Je pense que les étudiants ici ont beaucoup apprécié uh, ton intervention et ton « you talk to us straightforward ». So, on est très net et très bold à IBM. 
C'est-à-dire, on dit, on dit les choses comme on les pense. Je voudrais juste vous rappeler une chose. Notre fondateur, il y a 50 ans, le fils, faisait une intervention de même nature et disait une chose. « You can change everything. You can change everything. But your belief. » Vous pouvez changer toute une entreprise. Vous pouvez changer son business model. Vous pouvez changer sa stratégie. Mais il y a quelque chose que vous ne changerez jamais. Ce sont ses valeurs. Et c'est ça qui fait que IBM existe toujours après 100 ans. La deuxième chose, c'est sur la question du cloud. Euh, nous recevions au mois de juillet un grand directeur euh, des systèmes d'information d'une très grande banque, et il nous disait ceci. Si vous pensez que le PC a changé l'industrie de l'informatique avec le cloud computing, vous n'avez rien vu parce que ça change complètement la donne. Donc comme l'a dit John tout à l'heure, c'est une façon de consommer l'informatique qui va être complètement différente. Et la troisième chose que je voulais vous dire, pour rebondir sur votre question, c'est que de la même façon que vous n'imaginez pas faire vos études sans au moins parler l'anglais, voire l'espagnol, il y a une langue qu'il faut que vous maîtrisiez, c'est la langue des technologies de l'information. Parce que cette langue des technologies de l'information, elle est au cœur de la performance de tous les systèmes, des systèmes éducatifs, des systèmes d'entreprise et de votre propre succès. Donc, surtout, ne sous-estimez pas la technologie, parce que la technologie, aujourd'hui, nous fait ouvrir des horizons, Watson, qui, sont, euh, qui nous font faire en sorte que la société, on a un impact meilleur sur la façon dont le monde va fonctionner. Et c'est ça le progrès et c'est ça l'ambition de l'IBM. Voilà, merci à tous et merci à toi. Merci, merci à vous.